got an interesting topic on the docket for the first one of 2024, which is what happens when the employer is sued civilly. So we know what happens with our workers' comp cases and how to defend those in New York and New Jersey. Sometimes our insured gets hauled into the civil action, not necessarily a third party case. Sometimes it's directly against the insured. So we're gonna go into that. I wanna talk a bit about coverage uh, implications, uh, the concept of an intentional wrong, and then we're just gonna briefly touch on how all of this impacts our subrogation rights, uh, namely section 40 and section 29. So uh, this is a live webinar. You guys should have the um, questions box uh, on the right on GoToWebinar. And uh, if there are any questions at the conclusion, um, I will uh, address them. So without further ado, let's dive into our first webinar 2024. So what is workers' comp exclusivity? Um, that's the term we use for the exclusive remedy protection given to the employer. That's why the employee cannot sue us in civil court. So in both New York and New Jersey, workers' comp is referred to as the worker's exclusive remedy for damages arising from a work-related accident. In exchange for the immediate access to medical treatment and wage replacement benefits without regard to fault, yes, workers' comp is a type of no-fault benefit, uh, the worker surrenders any other cause of action they would have had against the employer. So the net takeaway is that generally, uh, if an employee accepts workers' comp benefits, that is going to bar any other claim they might have against the employer. So in New York, this comes from section 11 of the workers' comp law. Uh, what it says, liability of the employer for workers' comp benefits shall be exclusive and in place of any other liability whatsoever. Um, this applies to the injured worker or any person otherwise entitled to recover damages, contribution, or indemnity at common law or otherwise. Section 29.6 extends this protection further to coworkers and the insurance carrier. It's why they can't uh, sue the carrier or you know, a coworker in civil court either. Um, and there's an overlap here with the concept of general special employment. Uh, this protection is actually quite powerful and we did a special webinar, a special webinar on it a few years ago. Um, but for those of you unfamiliar with the concept of general special employment, Picture like um, a temp agency, like the Lent employee doctrine. You have a general employer that's you know, responsible for uh, payroll and getting the person to assignments and um, you know, the initial hiring process and all that other stuff. And then there's a special employer that the employee is lent to um, and that person or that employer controls their work and gives them equipment and they clock in and clock out with that employer. And in our comp cases, you know, it's a basis to argue, hey, there should also be another employer sharing and paying of workers' comp benefits here. It's a way to cut down our exposure. Um, the good news is, if general special employment is established, um, that protection extends to all employers in the employee hierarchy. So we actually had a case uh, specifically where we had a temp agency that lent an employee to a bakery um, and he actually, it was no other temp employees that were really involved. Our employee assaulted uh, one of the bakery's own employees. Um, so, you know, they're not technically co-workers. One is lent to the location of the bakery and does his work there on a daily basis. The other is li literally hired and paid by the bakery. So ostensibly they're not really co-workers, uh, but we were able to, to establish that the bakery was the claimant, uh, was the claimant's special employer. Uh, and then we were able to successfully argued, argue, hey, just as the temp agency would be protected, um, so would the special employer be protected. Or rather, just as the bakery would be protected, so would our employer, uh, the general employer, be protected. So um, the best way to think about it for ex exclusivity in New York is just if it's dead as to one employer, it's dead as to all of them. So there are some exceptions written into section 11. If the employer doesn't have the requisite workers' comp coverage, this is the one situation where the employee can elect between workers' comp or suing civilly for damages. Uh, if the employee sues the employer civilly, the employer cannot raise contributory negligence or assumption of risk as defenses and cannot argue the injury was caused by coworker negligence. Uh, why? Well, if the employer doesn't have the requisite workers' comp coverage and that forces the employee to sue them civilly, you know, why would the employer have greater defenses in that action by virtue of, you know, their own irresponsibility than they would have had um, in the workers' comp claim? If you can't argue comparative fault in a workers' comp claim, you're certainly not going to be able to do it uh, in a case where you didn't have coverage and then the employee sued you civilly. 
Um, the employee is not required to plead or prove freedom from contributory negligence in these types of cases, as we just discussed. Some other exceptions written into Section 11. Indemnity and contribution prohibited by Section 11 does not include a contractual agreement entered into before the accident. So this is your impleader action against the employer, or you know you might see it referred to in the docket as a third-party complaint. That is different than what we call third-party complaints for subrogation and lien reimbursement purposes. You know, we call when the employee sues the at-fault third party, we call that a third-party action. If you're looking at it from the civil case itself, the defendants that the employee sued, who are the third parties to us, they are suing the employer in a third-party action. So you'll see an initial complaint, an answer, and then a third-party impleter complaint. And that's the one that drags us into the third-party action in terms of the parlance we use. Um, so freedom from liability to third persons can be overcome with competent medical evidence showing a grave injury. Again, a contractual agreement doesn't implicate Section 11 at all. It goes right around it. Um, but if you don't have a contractual agreement to indemnify, you can still do common law indemnification. That's what they call it. Uh, if you have competent medical evidence showing a grave injury. If the employee has a grave injury, this has the effect of allowing the third party defendant to pursue indemnity and contribution from the employer. I just wanna note, um, this is not strict liability, common law indemnification. It's not, there's a grave injury, we haul in the employer and now it's their problem. All that allows them to do is force the employer to share in you know, the negligence of the civil case. So the employer, it, it, it's still gonna turn into a fact-based determination you know, about the extent of the employer's liability uh, in the happening of the accident. So it doesn't mean we deal with 100% of the damages, it just means you know, they can now apportion some fault to the employer. So what is a grave injury? Uh, specifically listed in the statute itself, death, permanent and total loss of use or amputation of an arm, leg, hand, or foot, we also call that dismemberment, Loss of multiple fingers or multiple toes, paraplegia or quadriplegia, total and permanent blindness or deafness, loss of a nose or ear, permanent and severe facial disfigurement, loss of an index finger, uh, or an acquired injury to the brain caused by external force, resulting in permanent total disability. So for our purposes, this would be a traumatic brain injury case uh, in a comp claim that ends in a PTD classification. I can guarantee you that if that happened, you know, particularly particularly if it happened on a construction site, you know, with a brick falling on the guy's head, and now all of a sudden there's a scaffold law claim, uh, I can guarantee you we're going to get um, impleted into that case if there's a TBI that results in a PTD. If a third party is sued, you can bet the employer is going to get hauled into it. So other exceptions to Section 11, this triggers once the employer's liability for workers' comp benefits is established. Uh, the employer can still be sued for an intentional tort or negligently caused injuries, which are not AOE, COE. In other words, they're not uh, arising out of employment or in the course of employment. It actually has to be a compensable work injury if you're going to claim workers' comp exclusivity. Again, the easiest way to think about it is just if the employee accepts workers' comp benefits, that's it. Um, no suing the employer. Um, Intentional injury perpetrated or directed by the employer is an exception to Section 11, and we're going to see it's an exception in New Jersey as well. Uh, but just note, it has to be deliberate and intentional, not merely reckless. Uh, the employer is still protected if a co-worker's intentional wrong was not instigated or authorized by the employer. Last bit of exceptions here. Um, if the injury is compensable under the workers' comp law, the injured worker cannot get around Section 11 by refusing workers' comp benefits. This is not an election of remedies, uh, as it says in section 29. Um, this is an exclusive remedy. You can't just say, eh, I'd rather not receive workers' comp. I'd rather just go after them civilly uh, if all the other prerequisites for a compensable accident are established. So it's not either or. If it's a work accident, you can't get around um, section 11 by refusing to accept comp. Again, unless we have one of those intentional injury cases. Uh, conversely, if the employee accepts workers' comp benefits, co-workers and the employer are protected from the intentional wrong claims. Uh, even claims for co-worker intentional torts are barred if the employee accepts workers' comp, uh, as otherwise the co-worker would, would not receive complete protection as intended by the legislature. We also call these action over suits against the employer. Um, you know, the concept being that if a co-worker is sued for an intentional tort, uh, they're inevitably going to turn around to the employer and say, 
well, hold on, uh, I was doing this at your behest. You're vicariously liable for this, or you should at least indemnify me for my losses. Well, then suddenly we've bypassed Section 11 just by having a coworker in the middle. So that's why they, uh, that's why the case law in New York has established that um, the coworker is not going to get complete protection if we permit these action oversuits involving um, a coworker. So uh, even those types of claims, as soon as the employee accepts workers' comp, are going to be barred. So let's turn to New Jersey, Section 8. Uh, I posted the actual language from the statute here, but such agreement shall be a surrender by the parties thereto of their rights to any other method, form, or amount of compensation or determination thereof. If an injury or death is compensable under this article, and I underlined a few key terms here, a person shall not be liable at common law or otherwise on account of such injury or death for any act or omission occurring while such person, person was in the same employ as the person injured or killed, except for intentional wrong. So um, again, it's contingent here in New Jersey upon a compensable accident. It has to be AOE, COE again, and arising out of employment or in the course of employment. That's what occurring while such person, person was in the same employee means. Uh, and again, we have the same exception here for an intentional wrong. So in New Jersey, we colloquially, colloquially refer to these as laid low claims, uh, intentional wrong claims in New Jersey. The original Millicent case said the employee is not precluded from also suing the employer in tort if the injury is caused by the employer's intentional wrongdoing. Side note, every worker's comp policy on earth and basically every type of insurance coverage on earth is going to exclude intentional wrongs. Um, we're gonna get into that in a little bit. Damages would be offset by the amount of the worker's comp benefits, so there's still no double recovery allowed under the statute. Uh, this is narrowly construed, and employer's actions must be substantially certain to cause the injury suffered. Uh, and then we have this Bustamante case, subjective intent to injure or substantial certainty that the injury will occur are required. So then we get to laid low, which actually gives us a two-pronged test eventually. So uh, that's how they interpreted um, the Millison case, the New Jersey Supreme Court. So prong one is the conduct prong. It relates to the employer's conduct by inquiring whether the employer has knowledge that its actions were substantially certain uh, to cause the complaint of harm. And uh, prong one requires both the substantial certainty analysis and a subjective desire to injure analysis. Prong two is context. We have the conduct prong and the context prong. Whether the injury and circumstances amount to more than a fact of life of industrial employment and are plainly beyond anything the legislature intended the workers' compact to immunize. So the context prong is decided by the trial judge. The conduct prong is going to be decided by a jury. The net effect is a very high bar for an intentional wrong claim in New Jersey. Um, you know, the, the sort of um, running joke, if you will, about the concept is you basically have to order them to jump into a pit of alligators. Uh, it is a very, very high bar in New Jersey, at least for the intentional wrong claims. So other instances of the employer being sued civilly, the New Jersey rules of court, some of you uh, in handling your comp cases may have come across these, they're um, kind of strange, but sometimes you'll see a um, civil complaint that includes the employer as a defendant, and then it has a separate cause of action for them that says for discovery purposes only. That is allowed. Uh, when does that happen? It's when third party plaintiff's counsel they're having difficulty identifying, you know, what the negligence is or who the culpable parties might be, and they want the employer's records. Usually it's in our best interest to play along within reason, and when I say within reason, I mean, let's not give these guys our AOECO reports that are prepared in anticipation of litigation. Let's not give them covert surveillance, again, another material subject to a privilege. Let's not send them communications with our attorneys. Anything we would normally withhold, we withhold. But you know nobody wants to be hauled into a civil case that they have to defend. So the best way to address these is to just call the phone number that's on the complaint under where the plaintiff's attorney signs off on the uh, complaint and just say, what are you actually looking for? And then you pull those items, you send them via email, you make it contingent um, upon them stipulating to discontinue us from the action or release us from the action. You send them the documents they want, they stip you out of the case and you're done you've now moved the ball forward on the third party case, increased the likelihood of getting reimbursed, minimized defense costs, defense costs, and now you wipe your hands clean of uh, the civil action. So uh, other instances where we can be sued civilly, New York's labor law, particularly the scaffold law, we talked about that one, uh, 
that's either falling from height or an object falling from height and stri um, striking the person. Either one will qualify, uh, provided that there's a violation of um, the industrial code or some other work regulation on the job site. Uh, employment practices, liability insurance type claims. Uh, that is something different than uh, employer's liability coverage. What are we talking about here? Discrimination, harassment, wrongful termination, things of that nature. Uh, Impleter actions against the employer for indemnification or contribution. We sort of touched on that. Uh, contractual versus common law we have here. Um, sort of similar to uh, New York where contractual indemnification is not barred by Section 11. But uh, if you're going to do common law indemnification against an employer, you need a grave injury. Sort of similar in New Jersey, except there just is no common law indemnification period. There's no grave injury exception. So New Jersey does not allow impleter for contribution under the joint, to joint tort feasors contribution law, but it does allow a contractual claim. There is nothing stopping an employer from agreeing to indemnify, you know, an, an eventual third party defendant in a civil case. So uh, let's dive into our coverage implications here. Uh, this stuff gets actually pretty interesting in my opinion. So if you've glanced at a worker's comp policy, you've probably seen it broken down by part one worker's comp and part two employer's liability. These are usually written together under the same worker's comp policy. Worker's comp is the part one coverage. Uh, employer's liability is the part two coverage. Worker's comp, like we talked about, is a form of no fault, whereas part two coverage is triggered by employer negligence. Uh, it doesn't actually say in there there is negligence required for us to indemnify you. That would just be silly. Uh, what I mean by that is that, you know, workers' comp benefits are statutory. You're not going to get triggered to pay something under uh, employer's liability insurance, uh, you know, unless you become liable to indemnify the insured for, um, you know, some damages or settlements they have to pay. So that's what I mean here when I say it's triggered by employer negligence of some kind. Um, part two coverage exists to cover work-related claims that are not workers' compensation. So let's look at what those are in a few seconds. Um, part two coverage also excludes amounts paid for workers' comp. You'll uh, find the exclusions in all of these policies are very much the same. So exclusion C4 is going to be the same across the board. Uh, this basically means an employee cannot recover twice under the same policy. We're also going to look at this in a little bit on our uh, Section 29 and Section 40 reimbursement rights because it's a similar concept there. Part two is not EPLI. We talked about that. Um, things like discrimination, harassment, wrongful termination, that actually falls under employment practices, liability insurance. I'm going to touch on this when we get to the Section 29 and Section 40 stuff. But yes, as the workers' comp carrier, we do have a reimbursable lien on those types of claims. Um, so what types of claims might fall under Part 2 coverage if it's not workers' comp and it's not EPLI? Well, we talked about the labor and scaffold law. Uh, basically, any work, any injury arising from employment that is not a workers' comp claim itself. So uh, if the employer is sued civilly because of, you know, strict liability under a scaffold law claim in New York, that is going to trigger our Part 2 coverage. Third-party action oversuits or impleter claims against the employer. Uh, again, common law only. Why? Uh, there is a specific exclusion under every Part 2 policy for contractual indemnification. That's exclusion C1. Uh, you'll see it phrased as liability assumed under a contract. So if there's a civil complaint, and we're going to look at an example together, but if there's a civil complaint that alleges both common law indemnification and contractual indemnification, our Part 2 coverage might be triggered under the common law indemnification. Again, assuming they have a grave injury and, you know, assuming we have some degree of provable negligence, but the contractual indemnification is the CGL carrier's problem. Uh, derivative claims, uh, you know, per quad claims, suits by the spouse or by an estate, um, you know, for a decedent uh, plaintiff, a discovery only suit, we, we sort of talked about those, but, you know, that'll trigger a duty to defend, but not a duty to indemnify. Ultimately, I'm going to talk about those in a second as well, those two distinct duties. Uh, exclusion C5, this is the specific exclusion I talked about for intentional wrongs. This is in all part two policies. What's actually kind of interesting is, um, you know, we saw the laid low court defined what qualifies as an intentional wrong. And believe it or not, that's kind of a limited definition, right? Um, it's, we talked about how you basically have to sentence the employer or the employee to jump into a pit of alligators. 
it actually limits what an intentional wrong is. So uh, what courts were finding was that the intentional wrong excluded under a policy was actually broader than the intentional wrong definition in New Jersey. And therefore, um, they were triggering uh, part two coverage for intentional wrong claims under the laid low standard. So naturally, insurance carriers got wise to this. And uh, you'll now see under your part two policies that are written for claims in New Jersey, there's a New Jersey specific policy endorsement that says, you know, intentional wrong is uh, the definition of intentional wrong is included to um, or is amended to include the intentional wrong contemplated by Section 8 of the Workers' Compact. So kind of a neat little analog that there's now a specific endorsement that addresses the laid low definition. Uh, the duty to defend versus indemnify. So the workers' comp carrier has a duty to defend uh, if the claim is even possibly within coverage. So the inquiry here is looking at the four corners of the complaint. If we assume everything in here is proven is true, we have no defenses whatsoever, no matter how meritless and silly it may seem. Uh, if it arguably could trigger, trigger our coverage if we never show up in the case, then yes, we have a duty to defend until we get out of the case. The duty to indemnify, however, exists pursuant to the insurance contract. Um, you know, the duty to indemnify is only going to be triggered if our insured becomes liable to pay some damages, either in a settlement or judgment. And then again, assuming that uh, the type of claim is not excluded and they complied with the terms of the policy. So if liability covered by the policy exists, the duty to defend exists. If we're not sure, what is my personal recommendation? Defending under a reservation of rights. And I'm gonna talk about what a good ROR letter looks like in a few seconds, but what is a reservation of rights letter? That's just basically your notice to the um, employer saying, hey, these claims have been made against you. Here's my policy. Uh, pursuant to these definitions in the policy, I don't think you're gonna get coverage. However, investigation is ongoing. So for the time being, I will defend you, you know, until further notice. That's basically what an ROR is. Um, the duty to defend and indemnify continued. The duty to defend does not end until judgment or settlement uh, or the insured actually agrees. So sometimes the best route here is to seek a declaratory judgment on the issue of coverage just to get out early. This really depends, however, on your relationship with the insured. Are they a massive client where you have tons of policies and you know tons of contracts with them nationwide? You know, in that instance, is it really in your best interest on a single New York claim to tell them, hey, you're out of luck, take a hike, report it to your CGL carrier? Probably not. You know, there might be a good faith or you know, sort of PR reason to defend them just to keep the relationship amicable and to you know keep the whole contract flowing. So this is something of a personal decision for carriers whether to go for the the DJ early on. Um, if this is a one-off, you know, if you've already stopped insuring these guys going forward because they've been immensely problematic, you know, to the point where you're Section 32ing all of your claims with this employer. Yeah, I'd, I'd probably try to get out of the case immediately with a DJ uh, if I had a basis to do it. Um, the policy limit tender, if you tender the full extent of the policy, that also does not end the duty to indemnify or the duty to defend, rather. Um, if the insured does not defend, so what are the consequences here if we do not assume our duty to defend? If we do not defend uh, and we are ultimately found liable, there could be a bad faith claim, breach of contract, attorney's fees and expenses. Uh, we could be bound to pay a good faith settlement that's within the limits, bound to pay the excess judgment if a pretrial offer within the policy limits was not accepted, et cetera. So if you don't defend and you don't show up, uh, everything's just gonna sort of happen in your absence. And then if your coverage is eventually implicated, you're just gonna be bound by whatever happened without having any say in the matter. So. That's why I'm, you know, I do recommend assuming the duty to defend at least until you can get out of the case. So a good ROR letter. Um, there's no real statutory requirements if you're looking for a section, you know, a legislative provision that says an ROR must include X, Y, Z. It doesn't exist, but common law has defined them over time. Give fair and prompt. I underlined that for a reason. Uh, you can't sit on a claim for six months once the insured reports it to you. So give fair and prompt notice to the insured of your intent to raise a coverage defense or pursue declaratory relief later on. We talked about that. 
Usually it's going to include a background to the claims. You're, there's going to be a preliminary statement that says, hey, this is the policy above, um, you know, for the reasons set forth at length you're in, we are defending you subject to a reservation of rights. And then it'll say background and it'll break down everything that's happened in the claim so far and the nature of the allegations against the insured. And then it's going to lay out, you know, here's this policy provision under, you know, this particular insurance contract. And here are the exclusions under that contract. And therefore, we are excluding coverage as to these claims. You break it all down for them in as plain English of a language as you possibly can. Um, we state uh, our possible defenses to coverage uh, with ref reference to specific policy provisions. Uh, yes, you are going to cite to the actual specific portions of the policy. Uh, it's a good idea to generally provide them with page numbers too. make it as easy as possible. Uh, if further, further investigation is required, notify the insured that your rights are reserved subject to additional facts. Um, be unambiguous. It's, it, it, I can't stress this enough that any ambiguity, and I'm sure you've seen this in your workers' comp cases, any ambiguity at all is always going to be construed against the insurance carrier. So uh, you want to be clear about what you're disclaiming or what you're defending under a reservation uh, and be explicit. Uh, disclaiming uh, bodily injury coverage for an accident in New York, you have to give notice to the insured, the um, injured party, or any other claimant as soon as possible, or the denial will be deemed ineffective. Uh, a reservation of rights does not extend your duty to disclaim coverage as soon as possible. So if you say I'm defending under a reservation of rights because I need more facts, the moment you get those dispositive facts, you should amend your, your coverage notice. You should immediately notify the insured saying, hey, turns out we're not going to be required to uh, indemnify you at all in this case, so I'm out. Uh, or alternatively say, we're withdrawing our reservation of rights and we're now just outright defending you. You do have um, a duty to actually you know, assume coverage or disclaim coverage as soon as possible. Uh, defenses not raised at the time you uh, make your coverage position are waived. So uh, again, I would be explicit and unambiguous and include any exclusions that you think might apply. Um, advise the insured of the right to appeal the determination and how to do it, particularly in New Jersey, um, and make sure you have the means of tracking delivery and receipt. You want to be able to prove that they got this thing. So here's an example situation with employer impleter, how this all sort of comes together under one umbrella. So let's assume our employer is a subcontractor and they have a contractual agreement wherein they agree to defend, indemnify, and hold harmless the general contractor and the owner of the property. So then the claimant sues the general contractor or owner, and let's just say in this fact pattern, the claimant does not have a grave injury. That means we're in New York, we're dealing with Section 11, but there's no grave injury here. So um, the GC slash owner then implead the employer for contractual and common law indemnification. Here's what's typically gonna happen. Workers comp uh, and the CGL carrier are going to agree upon, a defen upon defense counsel we are going to issue a um, coverage determination saying we're going to defend under a reservation of rights for the time being. Um, but we're going to agree upon defense counsel. We're going to share in costs until such time as coverage is resolved and we're out of the case. This would be a prime um, instance to seek a declaratory judgment. If they don't allege a grave injury and it's clear based on the medical reports there's no grave injury, we're ultimately, we're not gonna be bound on the common law indemnification claims and the contractual indemnification claims are expressly excluded as we just talked about with the um, C1 exclusion. So, you know, I want out of this case immediately if the relationship with the insured is not that important to me. Uh, so this is a good candidate for a DJ at this particular fact pattern. So we'll agree on uh, defense counsel and sharing costs of uh, defense until such time as coverage is resolved and we're out of the case. If the employer remains in the case somehow, the amount they pay in settlement or judgment will depend upon their respective negligence. We talked about that. It's not strict liability. Um, let's just say, you know, we don't catch the grave injury thing. Somebody's asleep at the wheel and we just, you know, continue to participate as if the impleter was legit. We still need some degree of negligence in order to have to pay part of the settlement or judgment. So it's not strict liability. Um, so that's how this would shake out. The CGL carrier would be responsible for defending the contractual claims. We would be responsible for defending the common law claims. We'd mutually appoint one defense attorney. We'd share in costs. And then once we get out of the case, the CGL carrier is on their own with that defense attorney. 
So impact on our section 29 and section 40 rights. Don't worry guys, we're, we're wrapping up here. Um, so I wanna be cognizant of the issue of having to reimburse ourselves. You'll see this a lot in the OSIP and CSIP concept, but if we're going to be paying under our part two employer's liability policy uh, and you know reimbursing our own section 29 lien, at least in part, um, you'll see the last bullet point on this page. Uh, that should be dollar for dollar, right? If you're reimbursing yourself and your policy, your employer's liability policy entitles you uh, to disclaim amounts payable under workers' comp, right? We talked about that being one of the specific exclusions to the policy. If you're allowed to exclude amounts paid in workers' comp from your employer's liability policy, then why are you only getting reimbursed two thirds of what you've paid in comp? So that's at least the argument I'd be going with is to the extent that I am getting reimbursed from what I am paying in the civil case, I am getting reimbursed dollar for dollar. I would absolutely make that argument. Uh, and that is how it works. At this, there's case law that says that's how it works in the intentional wrong context against the employer. Remember I said we have a lien on that. So just something to keep in mind. Um, be able to forecast your employee, your insured share of negligence for an informed reimbursement estimate. You know, if, if it seems like, you know, the general contractor in that prior fact pattern is 90% at fault, that's valuable information to have, right? If we did nothing other than just show up and generally employ the guy, and it's we provided him all the adequate safety equipment and all that other stuff, that's valuable information. Because now I know when I'm defending the workers' comp case, I can expect to get back probably about 90% of this. Um, if civil defense counsel is appointed for the insured, uh, I do recommend, I, we have a webinar called Keep It Under One Roof. I strongly recommend having the same firm handle both. Uh, it is just easier. You can posture it for a global settlement. Um, we've talked a bunch about global settlements in prior webinars, but it basically refers to the concept that you waive all or part of the lien to close out the workers' comp case for zero dollars or reduced dollars. It is the greatest way to close out a workers' comp case that is other languishing because otherwise languishing because you have all the leverage in the world at that point. You know, there's several hundred thousand dollars sitting out there that the employee desperately wants. And you go, I mean, gee, I'd really love to, you know, just consent to the settlement and pay this, but uh, you know, I might still have to pay you comp. So I just, I just don't know how this is gonna work out. Any interest in just closing it? And then you may not even have permanency opinions yet, but you'll find they're suddenly eager to get the money. So global settlements are great. I do recommend keeping it all under one roof with defense counsel and workers comp defense counsel, but I understand that may not be feasible depending upon who's on your panel. Um, so in those instances, I would definitely put your two attorneys in touch. On our end, when we handle a subrogation file uh, and we notice that the insured was um, impleted into the civil action and they are now being defended by an attorney, I ask the carrier for authority to reach out and speak with that attorney regarding the case. Why? Uh, we wanna coordinate our efforts, right? If we are able to prove that certain injuries are not causally related to our case, that's valuable information for them to have in disputing damages. Um, or if there's some factual developments about how the workers uh, or the employer did everything right, that's helpful for their defense. Uh, my biggest concern here though, is in New York, the issue of implied consent. If we participate as the employer in a, uh, let's say a civil action mediation, and we all agree, okay, a million dollars works for me, we'll contribute 100,000, you know, the, the other defendants will contribute 900,000. Sounds good. Guess what? You've just lost the right to do a written consent under section 29.5. You participated in a settlement hearing on the record, you know, and consented to the settlement then and there. Implied consent is a thing. So your offset rights and all of that valuable stuff we like to do in our 29.5 consent letters, that has all just gone out the window. So in those cases where we, our firm is not handling the civil defense uh, and I'm handling the subrogation case, I get authority to reach out to the civil defense attorney and I say, hey dude, can you just include this little disclaimer at the end of all of your emails and make sure I'm a part of the mediation if you ever get to that point? I wanna show up at it and make sure I'm around to at least say that little blurb. Um, <clears throat> Both New York and New Jersey permit liens on claims against the employer for an intentional wrong. And we talked about this. Um, if we're if it's our employer that's paying part of the settlement or judgment, the reimbursement to us should be dollar for dollar. Why? Uh, because we are allowed to disclaim under our employer's liability coverage um, 
amounts paid in workers' comp benefits. So it should always be that we're getting reimbursed dollar for dollar. Um, if again, only to the extent that our insured is paying part of the settlement. Um, liens on federal actions for um, hostile work environment, discrimination, including law against discrimination claims in New Jersey, battery and assault. We have liens on all of that as well. Uh, if the employer pays part of the settlement, the reimbursement should be dollar for dollar in both states. We talked about that. Uh, so with that, uh, I've been rambling on quite a bit. Looks like we're at 337 here. So uh, let's see if we have any questions. All right, not seeing any posts. Uh, let's go ahead and wrap this one up. Uh, as always, I appreciate you guys uh, attending. Happy New Year. Um, this is our first one of 2024. So here's to many, many more. I hope it was helpful. Uh, I hope I see you all next month. Uh, and again, thanks as always for being here.